I'm uh, glad to have this opportunity to update the House on the topic of business and COVID under this new format of statements and Q&A. I look forward to answering deputies' questions, and I will share my time with Minister Troy. Although today's topic is named business and COVID, I'll also speak about how my department is supporting employees. COVID-19 financial assistance, low-cost loans, and workplace health and safety guidance are there for workers as much as businesses. Every business saved is at least one job saved, a livelihood secured, and a family sustained. The financial support the government is providing businesses and workers is unprecedented. Almost a million people of working age are now in receipt of weekly payments, including the pandemic unemployment payment, employment wage subsidy, and job seekers benefit or allowance. Support for business includes the weekly CRIS payment for businesses forced to close their doors to the public, reduced VAT rates, a commercial rates holiday, the sustaining enterprise fund, the tourism business continuity scheme, as well as low cost loans. Last week, I announced 160 million in additional funding for businesses during the pandemic. This includes a new 60 million euro scheme called the COVID-19 Business Aid Scheme, or CBAS. It's being developed to provide grants to businesses ineligible for government's other existing schemes that are designed to help defray the cost of fixed costs. Wholesalers, suppliers, caterers, office-based enterprises, and events companies down more than 75% in turnover on last year and in receipt of a rates bill may benefit. While the grant is modest at €8,000, it will help smaller businesses in particular to cover some of these costs, such as rent, insurance, utilities and security. An additional €10 million will be allocated to the COVID-19 product scheme to help in the fight against the virus. Firms researching or manufacturing PPE, sanitizers, tests, equipment or other medicinal products which are relevant to the battle against COVID-19 are eligible for funding of up to 50% of their capital investment costs. The government also approved an additional 90 million for the Sustaining Enterprise Fund. This offers funding of up to 800,000 euros, with 200,000 or 50% in non-repayable grants to eligible manufacturing and internationally traded service companies. Deputies may not be as familiar with this fund as they are with other schemes, but it has proven to be very popular and has helped to protect 22,000 jobs across the state. The three main schemes, CRIS, EWIS and PUP, compare favourably with any other packages on offer in other countries. I think it's important to explain that the EWIS is designed to help with payroll costs and keep people in employment. The pandemic unemployment payment to help replace lost income for those laid off temporarily. And also the CRIS and CBAS are there to assist with fixed costs that businesses have to pay even when closed. The government is very much open to proposals from specific sectors as to how we can help further. However, I need to be clear, our schemes are there to help meet fixed costs that cannot be avoided and to provide basic weekly income support up to a maximum of €350 Euros a week. We cannot, provide pers we cannot provide compensation for loss of personal income above this level or compensation for loss of profits for any sector. To do so for any one sector would be unfair and to do so for all would be unaffordable. To complement the unprecedented levels of financial assistance to business, we're also going to fast track the introduction of a new low-cost summary rescue process, separate from the examinership process, which I know some people have referred to as examinership light. A public consultation is now underway and legislation is planned for the summer. My colleague, Minister Troy, who will speak later, uh, has responsibility for company law and he will take the lead on this. Turning to workers' rights, the government moved swiftly last year to introduce the COVID-19 Enhanced Illness Benefit. This payment provides €350 Euros a week to anyone who is self-isolating with COVID, awaiting a test, restricting their movements on the instru instruction of a doctor or the HSC. In most cases, it's paid for two weeks, but can be paid for much longer if somebody is out sick with COVID for a prolonged period. The existence of this payment is sometimes lost in, in the debate about sick pay. However, I acknowledge that the pandemic has highlighted the need to put in place a longer term sustainable scheme in place to cover all illnesses and bring Ireland into line with most other EU countries. I've committed to introducing a statutory sick pay scheme for Ireland as part of my work programme for this year. And having consulted with public unions and employers, we plan to have a general scheme by the end of next month with legislation enacted, I hope, uh, by the summer recess. 
Separately, in line with the programme for government, I have now formally asked the Low Pay Commission to examine and make recommendations on the best approach and design for a living wage for Ireland. This is now included in the Low Pay Commission's work plan for 2021, and I welcome the fact that the Irish Congress of Trade Unions has resumed and retaken its seats uh, on the Low Pay Commission. I am very conscious that the living wage, sick pay and auto-enrolment will present additional costs for businesses, particularly small businesses, over the coming years. So we have to carefully consider how we manage these major reforms, how they are sequenced and timed, and how the additional cost is met. Our objective is to improve terms and conditions for the many and to raise the threshold of decency for those in poorly paid and insecure employment. But of course, these objectives will not be achieved if, as an unintended consequence, businesses become less viable, hours are cut and jobs are lost. So we must guard against that and get the balance right. Part of my department's remit is protecting the health and safety of workers and members of the public in workplaces. The Government published the Work Safe Safely Protocol on the 20th of November 2020 to replace the Return to Work Safely Protocol. It incorporates the current advice on public health measures needed to reduce the spread of COVID-19 in the workplace, as issued by NEFID and the Department of Health. The Health and Safety Authority continues to be the lead agency for monitoring compliance with the protocol, but its inspectorate is substantially supplemented by deploying other inspectors from across government including people from the Workplace Relations Commission, the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine, Environmental Health Officers of the HSC, the Department of Education, and also the Sea Fisheries Protection Agency in Tusla. This has resulted in an additional 700 inspectors checking compliance with the protocol as part of their normal inspection regi regime. To date, over 25,500 COVID-19 inspections of workplaces checking compliance with the protocol have taken place. Compliance in workplaces is reported to be high, but we must remain vigilant. Officials are now re-examining the Work Safely Protocol in line with the new version of the Living with COVID-19 plan and any reopening of the economy that may occur later in the spring or summer. Turning back to the wider economic picture, I believe the pandemic has accelerated some of the deep structural shifts that were already in motion across the economy. The sudden shift online poses serious problems for the traditional retail industry, for example. And we've begun to see consequences of that unfold, unfold, for example, in the cases of Debenhams and Arcadia. More and more purchases are now happening online. And while there will be more jobs in tech, warehousing and delivery, there will be fewer jobs as sales assistants. So retraining and other opportunities will be key. The pandemic has also widened the digital divide. While many workers in well-paid jobs move seamlessly to the on online world, many customer-facing workers in more vulnerable sectors simply couldn't move online. At primary, secondary and third level, students from less well-off backgrounds and in rural areas have faced similar challenges, and the government has worked on a range of initiatives to help narrow this gap. On the positive side, the move online has proven that remote working can work on a mass scale. Our remote working strategy published last month set out our plan to build a new and better normal, incorporating all that we've learned from living our lives and doing business in a very different way for the past year. The requirement to work from home wherever possible has demonstrated how viable home, remote and blended working can be. And post-pandemic, I want remote working to be part of a new world of work. As part of this next month, I'll be signing a legally admissible code of practice on the right to disconnect. And later this year, we'll introduce legislation to provide employees with a right to request remote working. Despite all the challenges we face, I am optimistic for the year ahead, particularly the second half. I know when I spoke here last October for statements on the topic of business and Brexit, we discussed the very serious implications of a possible no-deal Brexit. Yes, the EU-UK Trade and Cooperation Agreement has led to some real difficulties for businesses, and we are working our way through them one by one. The economic outlook is nonetheless much improved because we have a deal. October's budget was premised on the basis of a no-deal Brexit and the absence of a broadly available vaccine. Neither scenario has materialised in 2021, which provides us with grounds for hope. On the downside, however, October's budget 
did not project, did not project a prolonged level five lockdown in January, February and March. Unlike previous occasions in our history, Ireland entered this economic crisis in a very strong position, with low unemployment, a budget surplus, falling public and private sector debt. And exports in 2020 broke all records. We're again expecting economic growth in 2021, at least as measured by GDP and GNI. This is driven by Ireland's booming export sector and the release of pent-up consumer demand later in the year. But as is often the case, headline figures such as GNP and GDP and GNI don't paint the full picture and don't describe the human experience of people currently living in this society and economy. The Irish economy is hurting and people are hurting and sadly will hurt for months to come. So in the short term, government will extend into quarter two the vital financial supports in place for business, including the CRIS employment wage subsidy scheme and the pandemic unemployment payment. We'll also provide more targeted financial support beyond quarter two for those sectors that have been particularly wounded by this pandemic, such as aviation, tourism, hospitality, the arts and entertainment. Count Corla, we will bounce back possibly sooner and quicker than some people think. But I'm not naive to think that things will go back to normal, nor should they. Some things will change forever. And the pandemic will leave scars, economic and social, lost family and friends, lost jobs and lost livelihoods. So our challenge is to rebuild the economy and not just return to the old normal, but to build a better new normal when the pandemic is over. I look forward to Deputy's questions. Thank you very much.